Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Okay, first thing I wanna do is to thank you for serving on this advisory committee and for your time and commitment to this process. This is an extension, of course, of the negotiated rulemaking committee on sexual harassment and assault. This is a subcommittee, essentially, of that committee with one additional member who is an, a member of an advocacy organization. Essentially, the way that this was constructed is that when we sent out the negotiation, the, the request for nominations from your CEOs of your institutions, there w it was a, it was a, a double no nomination. The committee, the, Individuals who nominated you to the, the negotiated rulemaking committee on sexual harassment and assault. Also, we requested whether or not they would recommend an individual for what is now being referred to as the Title IX Training Advisory Committee. And at this point, just for your information, this is an advisory committee to the board. Unlike the negotiated rulemaking committees that we have, those committees are negotiated rule-making committees, and we do not broadcast those. We want to have everyone have an opportunity to, to share their thoughts without worrying that they will be broadcast statewide. This particular meeting is an advisory committee to the board. So we are right now webcasting to those who were very interested in your work, and um, just to, I'll alert you to the fact that we are, are live broadcasting, okay? This is a brief meeting, and the reason it's a brief meeting is because, of course, the individuals that are around this table have been here all day negotiating the rules for the, the sexual uh, uh, harassment and assault. I will go ahead and introduce myself for the record. I am Mary Smith. I'm the Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Academic Planning and Policy at the Coordinating Board, and as you know, I also have the honor of serving as the Alternative Dispute Resolution Coordinator. But I am not a member of this advisory committee. I am a facilitator of this advisory committee in even less uh, fashion than I was with the Negotiator Rulemaking Committee. So I'm going to walk you through your packet, and you're gonna see some things on, on the screen here. Um, this, as you can see, we're the title, you are the Title IX Training Advisory Committee. And by, in way of background, Senate Bill 12 and House Bill 1735 that we have been discussing for the most part of this day uh, from the 86th Texas Legislature also amended certain sections of the Texas Education Code with respect to training for Title IX coordinators. So as committee members for the Negotiated Rulemaking Committee, you've been dealing with the rules pertaining to different sections of these two bills. But now we're focused now on the Training Advisory Committee. And with that, if you will take a look at your packet, we're going to just, I'm gonna walk you through just very briefly this packet of information and then I'm gonna uh, provide a little bit more background. But if you will look at the first item there, agenda item 6A2 is uh, essentially an emergency rule that is going to our coordinating board in October, the October 24th board meeting of our board is going to consider adopting the rules for this committee at its October the 24th committee uh, board meeting, I should say, the full board meeting. And so these are the rules that we're going to kind of go by because technically the board will adopt these rules, but because of the timeline, this committee needs to actually have a training program done by December the 1st. So we really couldn't wait for that to happen. So you'll, we'll refer to these rules a little bit. But the next little thing in your handout there, if you will look at it, is essentially the, the bills that you've been working on, 1735 and 212, but the information that is in front of you here pertains just to the work of this committee. So when I go through these slides, you can kind of take a look at these 
the synopsis of the two bills pertaining just to this training advisory committee, okay? So with that, I'm gonna move us along. So as you can see, and I, I again refer you to the more detailed information that's in your packet. Senate Bill 212 requires the Commissioner of Higher Education to establish an advisory committee to develop recommended training for persons required to report certain incidents under Texas Education Code Section 51.252 and for Title IX coordinators and Deputy Title IX coordinators at post-secondary educational institutions and to develop that recommended training not later than December the 1st. House Bill 1735 also requires the Commissioner of Higher Education to establish an advisory committee to make recommendations to the Board of the Coordinating Board regarding the rules for adoption under Texas Education Code Section 51.295 and to develop this recommended training for responsible and confidential employees designated under Section 51.290 and for Title IX coordinators at post-secondary educational institutions. I want to call your attention to the first bullet here. Because of this legislation, essentially what this means is that the work of the negotiated rulemaking committee itself, once they have achieved consensus, this committee needs to recommend to the board of the coordinating board. The, so it, I don't think it's going to be an issue, frankly, because you're all going to be coming to consensus on that bill. That, uh, on the rules pertaining to 1735 and 212. The only individual that is not on that committee is Rebecca Bernhardt, because she's our representative from the advocacy organization that's also required under, uh, it's under Senate Bill 212. So again, there was a little bit of a difference between the appointees of this committee in terms of the two bills. So 1735 required that the Commissioner of Higher Education appoint the members, but the members under that bill had to be recommended by the CEO of post-secondary institution. The other bill, 212, requires that they, that one of the members of this committee be from an advocacy organization. So in order to reconcile the two bills, essentially we have a recommendation from a CEO of a post-secondary education institution who has recommended Rebecca Bernhardt to be on this advisory committee. So that's how those bills were reconciled. So the goals that we have here in accordance with the two bills that you've just been working on, to develop the recommendation for the specified persons at the post-secondary education institutions by December 1, and to make recommendations to the board of the coordinating board regarding the rules for adoption that you have just been working on. So what's gonna happen is that once that committee re reaches consensus, then what we'll be doing is emailing to you that consensus bill, the rules I should say, and then we'll need to get your email response back making a recommendation to the board of the coordinating board. So that way we can reconcile these different aspects of these, these two pieces of legislation. You have any questions? Okay, all right. Then let's get the, uh, okay, that was really the call to order and introductions. But now, because this is an advisory committee, and if I will call your attention to these, essentially these rules that'll be considered on an emergency basis by our board next week, we need to actually elect a chair and a co-chair of this advisory committee. So, does anybody want to nominate an individual on this advisory committee to be the chair of the committee or to volunteer yourself to be the chair of this committee and then we will vote on that. I would be thrilled to nominate David Halper. <laughs> <laughs> well. As chair. <laughs> All right, so well, before we take a formal vote, would you accept this nomination, sir? 
Yes, if Krista Anderson wouldn't like to be chair, <laughs> I would like to nominate her or at least ask for her to be a co-chair. I would be honored to be a co-chair. Okay, so we have now a recommendation for a, a, a chair and a co-chair. Do we have a second on the co-chair? Second. Fine. So we will take a formal vote for David to be, let me just make sure I'm looking at the right material here. Here we go. Uh, I'll take a formal vote for David Halpern to be the chair of this ad training advisory committee. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. David, it looks like you're the chair of this training advisory committee. Thank you, sir, for your I willingness to I can't tell serve. Donna how much I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> and then now we'll take a formal vote on Krista Anderson being the co-chair of this committee. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Congratulations, Krista, you are the co-chair of this committee. So with that now, see, I really need to step aside but I'm going to go ahead and project the goals, which we've already done. And then if you all could then kind of go ahead with this agenda, because technically, you see, I am not a member of this committee. So the only real reason that we called it today was because you were all here and we need to be getting started on the work. So are you all right, David, with taking over the responsibilities of getting through this agenda, or would you want to delegate that to me at this point? Well, since you've so nicely offered, I would be happy to uh, delegate and serve in support of your facilitation. <laughs> Fine. Okay. The real thing that we need to do, if we can, is to collect from you all any training materials that you already have in place because if we can gather as much training material as we can, I think that we would be able to get through the work of this committee relatively quickly and in time for the deadline of December the 1st. So did anyone bring material, either electronically or in hard copy form, that can be um, shared with the members of this committee? Yes, I have, I have some training. Great. I brought it on a flash drive. Excellent. Um, and it, it's not complete because we had three different sets of training. If I can just back up a little bit about what the, because we had a little bit of discussion earlier on about how many trainings are we talking about and questions. what trainings. And initially, you know, we were thinking, oh, this is really one training, but I see a glaring uh, error in that analysis because I do not have training that would um, train confidential employees separately. So I really think we're talking about um, at least two trainings. I mean, the, the way the bills read, you've got to have training for responsible employees, uh, Title IX coordinators, deputy Title IX coordinators. I kind of see the one for the responsible employees the, the same as that for the Title IX and deputy coordinators. I, the bill is really designed to implement the totality of the legislation. And so I think what we're really talking about is putting on our employees on notice and our students and staff, et cetera, on notice that they are required to report. And so that to me is the very most important thing that we can accomplish. But there's a little subsection here about confidential employees that is a little different and nuanced. Um, and I don't have training in that regard. That's something that we would have to come up with unless somebody's got something totally nuanced for that. And the training we do have is uh, something that Erica Harrison worked hard, hard, hard on because we did training for all of our employees in the system, the University of Houston system. Last year, we did live training of all of our employees and we, did, we designed the training in different segments. So one is designed for folks kind of in the academic side of the house. One is designed for folks in like facilities and construction. So more in the administration side of the house. And then we had another set of training that was designed for the athletic 
uh, folks. So it's really one training, but it's got three different kind of components to it. And it is the training that I have has Im got embedded role playing and um, uh, live videos in it. It was designed to be facilitated live but I think it could certainly be adapted to something that was done online because I would hate to think that we are mandating or recommending live training across the entire state for everybody that is affiliated with a university or um, a college that I just don't see as doable. Um, but anyway, that, I just wanted to give you that background and tell you what we did have and I'm hoping that others have something else. I was particularly proud of what the group did in our Title IX office. Um, I really give a lot of kudos to Erica and I think it, it was well received, frankly, even by some of our most difficult clients being like faculty who don't want to do live training, think they know everything, no offense to whoever's listening to that. Um, but uh, and and it, w it worked well even with you know, our folks that um, uh, don't deal with these kinds of issues on a regular basis. We also had it in Spanish, um, and I'm not sure if we had it in any other languages. But we certainly contemplated that because we have a large Asian population in Houston, so we were trying to be res responsive to the different populations of employees that we have. So, but we do have it in Spanish also. And sign language. So that sounds amazing. I have a sort of point of clarification or discussion because I think there already has been some confusion on campuses that I've heard around making sure we're distinguishing between the Texas law and Title IX because our new statutes are not Title IX. And so when people talk about them like they are, I think it creates some confusion. And we know that there are likely new Title IX regulations coming out. And so I just want to clarify the goal of our committee is to train on the tech, the new Texas statutes and not Title IX, and in that sense, there may be like components of that training that work, but I- Clearly, I, absolutely. Okay. There will, I just wanted, to, it was just a baseline. It definitely will need to be adapted to this, this law, but I don't think it'll be like a heavy load to do that if you all decide to use this or something else. I just think that, I just wanted to bring something that I thought worked really well for our group. And but it, but it is really the goal is on the Texas specific Absolutely. provisions is what we are doing training Absolutely. for. Absolutely. Okay. We, we called it the mandatory reporter training. So it was focusing more so on reporting, which I think is kind of the, the basis of the state law. That's super helpful. So we haven't done a training, but we've done a uh, public FAQ and a lot of other just educational type documents on our campus relating to the new laws already, so we can share those. Um, yeah, and I, um, at System, we don't, we actually did a system-wide Title IX training. Um, so I have all of the materials um, that we did from that this past August, uh, as well as, um, uh, materials that I developed with my Title IX office when I was still at UT Austin that's still pretty relevant that is similar to um, training basically all of our mandate, mandated uh, reporting obligations of our employees um, and um, kind of just the foundational pieces that our employees that we wanted our employees to know about. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to send those on as well. Did you have, have you, has anybody done any training specific for confidential employees? I have. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. I've also, uh, with the advocacy office, worked on some training for the confidential employees. Good. And Rebecca, am I correct that you're, you all have training that you also do uh, on both of those topics for both mandatory reporters and confidentiality? Not that I know about. Okay, I'm thinking of someone else. Okay. We uh, at UTRGV we actually came up with uh, an online training specific to the Texas mandated reporting of certain types of sexual misconduct. So I have an online link to that. 
All right, and then I'm sorry, I have one other sort of clarifying question or something to just to think about as we go forward. Since a lot of us, I think, probably have this integrated, some of us probably use vendors, some of us probably have sort of live, we, I think we probably all have a mix of things, so I think I'm trying to understand, are we actually trying to come up with something that we're telling people to implement, or are we wanting to define the topics and sort of the recommended things that are covered that campuses can then implement in a way that works and fits for them, since a lot of this is also policy specific. Statute says develop recommended training, so I don't think it's mandated. It's just, I think, can be designed to be a resource for folks. I, I agree. I think we should also remember that we discussed this committee putting together our template for our Title IX coordinators also, which I don't think is really training like we're talking about training right now. Right. So just a note. Yeah, when I was initially reading the, um, uh, the advisory committee sections when it says uh, training the Title IX coordinator, I was kind of thinking in the lens of um, like just their role and responsibilities. I wasn't necessarily thinking in the, in the lens of them being, yeah, their administrative reporting requirements, but um, maybe that was the, one of the spirits of the law is that we do need to help the coordinators in that capacity. So if there is clarification, that would be great. I don't know. That's how I read it, is how they implement the new Texas okay. statutes, because they should already be getting title training on how to be a Title IX coordinator under Title IX. So we're really looking at how they adapt the Texas law, as I read it. I agree, and we kept saying that people won't have the benefit of having been in the room with us during the rulemaking committee. So some of those things that are, we can kind of flush that out in that training, some pieces like this is the floor, not the ceiling, about how you how you read and review the, the, the rules. And maybe that for Title IX coordinators, and I don't want to get too, again, specific for institutions, but maybe it's more of like an FAQ of some of those things that the committee discussed along with the template, because the template would just be a recommendation or a may use if you'd like. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we wouldn't even have to get really specific, but maybe just share some of those notes that would speak to the spirit of our intentions, I suppose. Mary, I do. I, <laughs> I do think that for 212, I agree with Rachel, I think that we are going to have to be more than a resource because the resources aren't there. And that would suggest that much of our negotiate, negotiated rulemaking committee's work would inform uh, how we suggest or offer suggested trainings for administrative reporting requirements, which is what 212 speaks to. Make sense? And, and actually, I should add that 212 also, in our rulemaking, it, it would bear on some of the training for the confidential Correct. employees as well. <laughs> One question I had when I was reading the legislation, it, it doesn't really talk about how to disseminate it. It really just talks about developing the training. And just as it, it kind of, you know, serendipity, right? But we're recognizing for excellence at our October board meeting a gentleman by the name of Richard Leslie from McLennan Community College who used a Perkins grant essentially th over a three year period to develop. ADA training across the state. So he has offered to help this committee when the time comes to help determine how you might be able to use your LMS systems and put it online. And then as far as I understand it, and I am no expert on technology, that's for sure. But he, uh, you might wanna, his name is um, 
Richard Leslie, he's the coordinator for uh, coordinator center for in instructional design at McLennan Col Community College. And in a nutshell, as far as I understand it, he puts the courses on the LMS system and then he exports it to an export package. And then the institutions that want to use it have an import package and he then provides a webinar to how to use those systems. So my concern, frankly, when I was reading this is how are you, once you get it, you can't very well email it to everybody in the state, but potentially you might want to think about using, apparently the, the system uses Canvas, Google, it doesn't work so well on Blackboard apparently, but apparently he does it through a zip file. So somehow or other, the institutions that want it can download it into their own system. And then if, if this advisory committee would be interested in learning more, one thing, he, you could actually watch our board meeting on Thursday of next week, the 24th of October. He's scheduled to be recognized for excellence at approximately 10 o'clock. So on our website on the 24th, if you just pull up our main website, there's gonna be a link to our coordinating board meeting in the same way that there's a link on our website right now for this advisory committee meeting. You could watch that and he's also happy to come and address the committee when the time comes. So that's one thing I just wanted to add for your consideration. Given that you all have brought some things with you, one thing I thought we could do is we could put, I don't know how big these things are, we could collect them here and be ready for your next meeting because I know that we're not going to really get any really work done today and I mean, unless you want to. I, I don't know that you do. But one thing, if we could just collect what you've got on my computer or on David's computer since he's the chair of the committee, <laughs> either computer, it doesn't really matter. But if you somehow we could get that material off of wherever you've got it and put it in a centralized location so that the committee can begin to use what you've got and tweak it, kind of like we did with the draft rule. And then, in accordance with the agenda, we've been discussing, and then essentially you would be, as the chair and co-chair, making actual assignments for the next meeting. So that would be one way to go. Mary, I, w I would uh, suggest that the coordinating board be the custodian of the materials for the advisory committee. Fine. And we're in the process of obtaining our training materials for the A&M system, and they will also be shared That'd to be the coordinating great. board. That'd be Is fine. there a way to share them, like through 365 or some kind of Dropbox from you guys' in? Because our file is really, really big. Yeah, and that's what I was worried yeah. about. It's ours is, huge, probably, ours right? is really only a flash drive or yeah. through, through, through a, um, an online, a cloud means. The only time that, we, that we've hit, like when we have really huge files coming over from our board meeting, for our board meetings, what we sometimes no have is the individual will allow us to get into their own Dropbox by giving us a code. And that we, we, can, we can grab it that way. But then you have to give us permission to get into your Dropbox. I can, I have the, our versions via Dropbox, well via 365, so I can provide that link that way. I just need to get emails from everybody and I can send you a link so you can see it electronically. Fine. Would it, um, just another idea or proposal is, what if we came up with the major topics that we wanted to cover in each of the respective trainings and then from there we could start building out the curriculum because I think we might end up being just a repository of a whole bunch of training and then it would be very overwhelming for us to view every single person's training. It might be easier just to kind of work with an outline and then we can all use our resources to you know, add, add the curriculum and content. Sounds like a very good idea. I agreed. Okay. Maybe what we could do is um, put together little work groups to come up with what should be in the curriculum. Okay. And, 
instead of necessarily sending all of the training materials, send those training materials that would match the curriculum we're coming up with. Mm -hmm. um, It would seem that the existing training materials are more likely to inform our responsibilities under uh, House Bill 1735, right? We didn't have these uh, 212's reporting requirements. And for 212, I think we will be developing not only, probably not so much resources, but some kind of curriculum for responsible employees, the coordinators, deputy coordinators, and the confidential employees. Yeah. I will say uh, Florence's uh, materials that she developed so far, specifically for 212, I think probably is the most in line with, I think, what we're thinking of. And then, um, and then if we do have response, or we call them responsible employees in the UT system, but basically mandated reporter, training I think may also be in line how voluminous are those trainings could we review those it's nine slides I was gonna okay. say is there a way for us to kind of review these top like you have one on confidential reporter or resources kind of, and then the UH like these four and from there develop that curriculum just to get some get our ideas yeah. flowing I guess I'm a little yeah okay creative and I can send a link, it's a soft talk training. Yeah, I think that might be a challenge as we go forward is figuring out how to integrate them because they're gonna be on different platforms potentially uh, and different media um, and institutions are gonna want to implement them in different ways with their existing training resources. So that will be something that we'll have to think about as we make recommendations. Um, if, if they don't get adopted outright, it could be the content could be helpful. The one thing that I really want to see in whatever we produce is something that is really meaningful to people. You know, I've seen over my years, you know, training that is just a click the box kind of thing that is just wholly unsatisfying on so many different levels. It's boring for the employees. It's it it it, it people don't pay attention. They have it on in the background. To me, what was so great about what Erica came up with, and I'm sure some of these others, is the real live examples, some role playing that allows people to see like an example of somebody making a report and what do you do with that and how it can go wrong if you don't handle it well. So to me, that would be just like, I just wanted to share that with the group. I just feel really strongly that just in terms of the feedback we have gotten from, you know, having done this to, with so many different people, that was probably the most valuable thing that we've ever done as a system since I've been there in terms of training. And as everybody here knows, we do a lot of it. Why don't we circulate? Why don't we circulate Erica's training, the training on confidential employees, and the training that you have, Florence, as well? Yeah, I can, let's start I can with that. Link. Florence, is yours also confidential employees? Is that what I heard? Uh, I'm, I'm developing one, but it's not finalized. But uh, the one that UTRGV developed is, is specific to the mandatory reporting under the Texas legislation. Okay. Why don't we come back with kind of our own, sort of what we did with the rulemaking committee, our own goals, if you will. I'm sure most of these will want, they'll line up pretty, and that would be our, kind of our outline as the next step. And so I had a, more of a legal question. Are we, is this uh, an op, considered an open meeting? I mean, I, I assume it is, but can we talk to each other outside of the? Yes. Okay. That's what I want to make sure I'm not violating any law. <laughs> A question I have under 1735, uh, our, our duty includes confidential employees, but insofar as we now have the student advisor, confidential, uh, 
confidentiality issue, that may be beyond the scope of our authority, but that seems to be one of the more challenging areas for purposes of training that 1735 contemplates. I mean, student, excuse me, student advocates. Thank you. Thoughts about that? I definitely see that as a subset as part of the confidential training. I don't, it might be better to make it a subset and, you know, as required if this is, at, or if, if this is applicable, we're going to have a few slides or explanations as it relates to student advocates. I have to think through whether or not it's, it, whether they're circles that are connected or they're totally separate. I just, I have to look at the statute more carefully. But that's a great point because I don't, hadn't really thought about it like that. Well, I, just for reference, um, UT Austin does have a um, peer, student peer uh, advocate group, um, and they do have a pretty robust training. Um, they actually do 40 hours of training with them before they go out and do what they do. Um, and they're all volunteers. They're not paid. Um, so I'm happy to get that, compile that. It might be very, um, there might be some mirroring of, of other components and especially like the Title IX coordinator training, but yeah, um, it's accessible. And at ETRGV, there's graduate students who are trained as advocates through the Office for Victim Advocacy and Violence Prevention, and I can see if I can get that training, but it is also quite extensive. I'm preparing to send you guys just an email link now so I can get this off my off my desk. But um, do you have an email I can use for you? Sure. I'll write it down. I got everyone. As I'm looking at those things we're responsible for, it seems to me, going back to Donna's uh, suggestion, which I support, pulling together resources, I'm asking you all, it seems to me the resources are likely to focus on trainings for responsible employees as it relate, th the resources that currently exist for Title IX in general. It seems to me that as we are interpreting 1735, that would be, if anywhere, where we put together a compendium of resources. The other trainings we're gonna pull together ourselves, develop either adapting what we have in-house. Yes? Yes, I concur. <laughs> Mary, what else? The main thing is really today is to figure out the, name, the, the next meeting date because if you can possibly meet the first week in November, and I was focusing in on November the 6th, if you could look at your calendars. And it doesn't need to be, but my concern is that if you need to have two meetings, and we've got Thanksgiving coming up, and frankly, we have a annual leadership conference that we are involved with. It would be good if we could think about potentially a first week in November meeting where you would come back. Is it possible that I, I imagine that we'll finish pretty early tomorrow, I imagine, with the, uh, the other part. Is it possible for us to convene after that? Um, let me think. I don't think so because okay, see, this is an advisory committee that we actually have to post. So technically, we have to have a 10 day posting period and okay. it needs to be webcast across the state. I would suggest, though, that you could exchange information, but to have a formal meeting, we have to post it. Where I think that might be helpful uh, for us to informally uh, look at our agenda and our charge would be the formulation of 
committees, for example. We don't have to decide that. Maybe we sleep on that and come up with ideas for committees and the topics for the allocation of, yeah, the tasks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We could discuss that. We can discuss that. Right. Tomorrow. That'd be fine. Yeah. We just make, you, you understand, we have to make Absolutely. sure that the state's watching, you know, to think about it. Right. Right. I think I, I, you know, from my perspective, it would, since I am not an expert in this at all, and you all are, I like the idea of the curriculum and then plugging in, because you're right, we could get inundated with material that wouldn't necessarily be in any order that would be helpful to you. So that sounds like a great idea to me. But to clarify Donna's question, we can communicate via email or meet as subgroups, working groups, as part and of And I'm going to make sure I'm right. We have our attorney right here. Okay. Um, for, for that week, for November, uh, the week of November 6th, I am already out of town except for that Friday the 8th. Okay. So if we were to meet that week, I, I would like to propose Friday the 8th. Okay. Otherwise, I'd, I'd have to look at the next week. All right. Let me, I'll tell you what, let me, let me get into my email here and we'll see if we can reserve a room. We don't obviously have to have the board room. We do have a smaller room. It's the, our, we call it the Lone Star Room. It also can broadcast. So we have two rooms that can broadcast. Yeah. So give me a minute. How does the 8th look for everybody in here? It looks good. Okay. That date's not great for me. I will make it work if I have to, but my other sort of concern other than that just sort of personal concern is that only gives us two weeks after that, and then it's Thanksgiving week, and the first is actually a Sunday right after Thanksgiving. So just... I mean, if, as long as we're comfortable that only having two work weeks after that would give us enough time to get it done by the deadline. Got it. And then, you see, we have to post the meeting. Once, once we decide on the meeting date, we have to post it in the Texas Register. Mary, is there any purpose served in looking at the end of the week before the week of November 4th, or is that... It, it, you can, whichever week works for you all, I'm... Yeah, let's look. Let's see. Okay, so we're looking at. Let me. I tell you what. Give me a minute to. Okay, the eighth it is. Okay, let me make sure we can get a room. I think, yeah, we had a tentative hold on this room actually, for uh, a negotiated rulemaking committee uh, for, on the core curriculum, but that's getting postponed. So I think we're going to be fine on the 8th. Does that work for everybody? And then Kathy, I think, has the response on whether or not you can communicate during meetings. Not quite yet. Okay, never mind. Sorry. <laughs> I, I am pretty sure <laughs> if that's illegal. It's efficiency, but... Legal or illegal? Legal. Oh, legal, okay. legal, legal, legal. Yeah, uh, because we, we, I'm told we do it for other advisory committees. Yeah, I can't see how you possibly get your work right. done if you couldn't communicate right. a little bit during the meeting. But I guess what we would obviously say is that there would be no substantive decisions made by this right. committee without having it broadcast. Is there a time on the 8th that this was held or we were? How about 9.30? Do you like that? I mean, that's what we generally have for these types of meetings. And let's see, make sure I'm good here. So we'll, so what I'll do then is work with the two co-chairs on developing an agenda for that meeting. Because at this point then, it's, you know, really not my committee. So, but I'm glad to help. I'm basically your, your facilitator in a different, way than I was the facilitator of your other meeting. <laughs> Does that make any sense? <laughs> I, help, I, I provide you what you need as a, a staff person at the coordinating board. Let, let me ask a question, and that is, hypothetically, if after those of us who are here tomorrow develop a plan for committees that we would like to discuss with those who are not in attendance via email, 
and we then determine, yes, we've got several, three committees and people who fit well uh, in them so that we could prepare for our next meeting without any substantive decisions, but just moving toward that. I'm asking if that would be acceptable because that would be a good use of our time between now and the 8th. It would work for me. How about you, Kathy? Okay, that's what we'll do. Okay. So at this point then, we'll, we'll start focusing in on getting an agenda together so that we can post it in the Texas Register in time for the meeting on the 8th. And really, let's see, I think there's really, I, I don't know that there's any other business that needs to be done today, unless you all. Do we, as uh, a committee uh, mandated by the ledge, do we uh, follow rules of order? Do we make motions second? And if so, do we do that now? A motion? <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? I think we just made our first decision. <laughs> Non-substantive. And thank you so much for your willingness to serve on both of these committees. We really appreciate it. Thank you again. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. Great.